Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the Borg. Well, okay, not really that Borg from Star Trek, but something biological discovered here on planet Earth whose name was inspired by this alien species from Star Trek. A relatively recent discovery coming from the kingdom of Arcaea of an unusual genetic structure that the scientists have never seen before and that seems to have very unusual properties that we've never seen either. And specifically, these genetic structures seem to assimilate become better, become stronger, perfect themselves, and by extension, also help the Archaea to do the same. And so because of these unusual properties, the scientists named them Borg, with some of the articles and some of the studies in the description below describing this in a little bit more detail. But in this video, I wanted to give you a kind of a summary of what the scientists have learned about these unusual structures, what they mean for our understanding of biology, and what the scientists think we can maybe use them for one day because these particular Borgs actually represent something that we've used practically in a lot of different fields of biology already. And these Borgs are part of what the scientists usually refer to as ECEs or ECDNA or extra chromosomal DNA. Any kind of a genetic material that's found outside of main chromosomes inside the organism, usually somewhere inside the cell itself, but sometimes even outside the cell as well. And one of the best examples here is something we refer to as plasmids. Very small structures, very often circular in shape, that contain a lot of additional genes that certain bacteria use for survival, but can also share with others, because these plasmids can reproduce themselves and can then spread across various species. And actually one of the ways many bacteria today acquire a lot of resistances, including resistance to various antibiotics, is basically by sharing plasmids and genes within them. And so you'll have one organism that acquires these particular properties and then shares this with others through replication of these plasmids, with plasmids eventually spreading across, allowing all of the bacteria to acquire these particular properties. And though they do come in different shapes and different sizes, for the most part they do serve the same purpose. They represent extra genetic material that can be used by various bacteria and archaea when, for example, things do not go as well as planned. For example, when conditions become extremely hostile or when there is a lot of competition. To some extent, they can also be actually compared to viruses because they do kind of do very similar things, but unlike viruses, they actually help the bacteria and various archaea. But in modern molecular biology, the scientists found a way to use these plasmids for quite a lot of different purposes, with the biggest one being genetic cloning. And so when the scientists need to use some kind of a gene that needs to be cloned, they'll use plasmids for this purpose. You can even buy them online today and they're not very expensive. But plasmids is something that's mostly used by bacteria or prokaryotes. But we also have this other kingdom that's generally not seen as bacteria anymore, known as archaea. And because archaea generally lives in a lot more extreme conditions and is not as well studied, we don't really know exactly what they use for similar purposes. Some of them have been discovered to have similar versions of plasmids, but because these are different organisms, they obviously have very different ways to survive the environment. And because archaea, as I mentioned, lives in extreme conditions, they obviously have to find extreme ways to adapt and very quickly. Which of course implies that maybe their versions of plasmids would be super super complex. And it looks like this particular assumption is kind of correct. Because not so long ago, the scientists discovered something very unique inside these somewhat unusual archaea. The archaea that only live in conditions where there is a lot of methane. These are actually known as methanoperedins. Or basically these particular archaea rely on methane for survival. But since these are ancient organisms that probably existed on the planet for billions of years, today the scientists believe that back then, back in the days, when the earth was still young, they might have actually been some of the first, if not the only life on the planet. And since on the early earth we believe there was quite a lot of methane, which is also something we believe exists on a lot of other planets and even moons out there, including of course the iconic moon Titan, where there's probably quite a lot of methane hidden underneath. Trying to learn more about these organisms that survive on methane is also important for a lot of studies of astrobiology. But in this case, when studying this bacterium, the scientists discovered something unusual floating around in a cell outside of the main chromosomes. Something that seemed to be huge in size compared to any other plasmid, and represented about 600,000 up to 1 million DNA base pairs, basically being one third of the total length of the main chromosome of each of these microbes. So much much bigger than any plasmid we've ever seen, and almost as big as the DNA of the organism itself. But more importantly, the reason it's called Borg is because it seems to be constantly growing, constantly improving, becoming more complex, absorbing more genes, 
and are basically creating some kind of a genetic repository for a lot of additional genes some of these archaea can use if they need to. And that's basically their main purpose. They're not really in possession of essential genes that are needed for, for example, reproduction, but they do possess additional genes that are required for survival when conditions become much worse or when things become a little bit less hospitable. And since a lot of these bacteria are extremophiles, living in very extreme conditions, they obviously need to keep track of a lot of different survival tricks in order to be able to adapt to various conditions when things suddenly deteriorate which is most likely how they were able to survive for billions and billions of years, even though Earth itself no longer has methane-rich conditions, as it did in the past when these archaea were probably everywhere. Now they only seem to survive in methane-rich conditions, and actually quite likely exist inside our bodies as well. Because we do have quite a lot of methane generated inside our guts, chances are we might have something similar right now inside our own bodies. Since this is a relatively recent discovery, we obviously still don't really know. But what makes these archaea very interesting to the scientists is really the fact that they're so good at breaking down methane, which as you probably know is an extremely potent greenhouse gas as well. As a matter of fact, not so long ago, NASA released an interesting map showing us a lot of so-called methane super emitters on the planet, basically showing us all of the regions on the planet where a lot of methane is released for one reason or another. Usually it's agricultural in nature, but sometimes the actual source is not really well understood. For example, this right here, is in Turkmenistan, and it seems to be in the middle of the desert. And so the scientists are always curious to find out if we can actually find an effective way to break down methane, especially at the source itself. For example, can we actually introduce something right here in order to reduce these emissions? Which is exactly one of the main reasons why the scientists went on a long search in different wetlands in California, trying to discover these particular archaea that they believed to exist there. But what they didn't expect was that they would have these unusual properties and these unusual borgs that seem to help them in digesting and destroying methane. With the recent analysis determining that they actually do seem to contain quite a lot of genes required for various methane metabolic processes. Which of course also implies that, in theory, we could then introduce some of these borgs to some other bacteria that we can control easier in order to consume a lot of methane and possibly even produce something out of it. Although unlike plasmids, which are much smaller and much easier to control, these borgs seem to be huge and so it's not really entirely clear if they can ever be used and successfully reproduced in typical lab conditions. And here the scientists also believe that these borgs might have actually been their own separate organisms a long time ago, but might have been actually absorbed by the bacteria and thus became a part of the organism with only DNA remaining in the process. But because these particular borgs are so huge in size and seem to have assimilated a lot of genes from a lot of different species, the scientists also want to discover if there's actually association with other species as well. Or basically, do these borgs store the genetic material for more than one species and are they basically a kind of a genetic library for a lot of different species of different archaea and potentially bacteria to be used in inhospitable conditions? because it doesn't really make sense that just one species of archaea would develop these huge structures as this would be very difficult and very expensive, metabolically speaking. It just doesn't make sense for these huge structures to exist just for a single species. And so some of the other recent studies, including the one you can find in the description, performed additional analysis discovering that these particular borgs do come in very different shapes and sizes, but certain methanopyridans or certain archaea didn't actually have any borgs with other ones possessing more than one Borg. Implying that, as suggested initially, this is very likely something that co-evolved with these archaea and basically served as a kind of a public library of genetic material that could be used by anyone at any time. With some Borgs even containing genetic material encoding for proteins and membrane proteins that seem to have come from different species entirely. With some proteins even having unknown effects that the scientists could not figure out with the most recent study also discovering that there definitely seems to be a genetic advantage to having these borgs than obviously not having them during certain times of the year. So for example, even though a lot of different species might consume methane, it's really only archaea that possess borgs that were exceptionally good at growing and proliferating during times of the year when not a lot of methane is released, such as for example in early spring. And so during those particular periods of the year, the methanopyridans were still actually very successful at consuming methane, even though other bacteria or other archaea weren't. And here it's very likely because of these borgs. But because this is still a pretty early discovery, 
And because the scientists still are not entirely sure where these genetic materials came from or what their main purpose is, except for providing additional defense or additional survival tricks, chances are that in the next few years we might be actually talking about something entirely different when it comes to these extracellular DNA molecules. Nevertheless, a pretty interesting discovery in terms of biology and a very important discovery for a lot of scientists studying astrobiology. It really shows us how a lot of these ancient organisms learned to adapt to various conditions on the planet, especially when the planet went through dramatic changes in terms of the actual atmosphere and climatic conditions. And so even though these particular organisms probably thrived on Earth early on, once Earth changed enough, they had to rely on different strategies to survive and to thrive afterwards, with the Borg being the answer. But until future discoveries or until we learn something else, that's all I wanted to mention. All the relevant links and studies in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.